We now begin to session number three on the topic, assessing compliance with a decision under UNCLOS. And Professor James Harrison from the University of Edinburgh will moderate this session, and he is online right now with us. Professor Harrison, hello there. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well, so please kindly take the floor. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you all enjoyed your lunch. Um, it's a pleasure to join you, and I can only apologize that I can't be there in person. Um, I was asked at late notice to step in and to moderate this session, and I couldn't arrange my plans to make it to Seoul, but it looks like I'm missing uh, what is a fantastic conference, and it's a real shame not to catch up with uh, many friends and acquaintances who have some of whom I've not seen for a long time. But the most important people are in the room with you. That is our three speakers this afternoon. And it's my job mostly to introduce them and keep this session running smoothly. Um, the theme of session three is compliance with UNCLOS decisions, uh, decisions of courts and tribunals. And we have two different perspectives on this topic to be offered. The first speaker is going to be Mr. Lawrence Martin. Uh, Lawrence is co-chair of Foley Hoag's International Litigation and Arbitration Department. He has lots of experience in this matter and he will be talking to us on the topic of um, assessing the success of UNCLOS Part 15 uh, after 40 years um, with a particular focus on disputes where participants do not participate and challenges of ensuring compliance with decisions of courts and tribunals. Our second speaker uh, is a very old acquaintance of mine, Professor Douglas Guilfoyle, who is now Professor of International Law and Security at the University of New South Wales in Canberra. And Douglas will be talking about small states and great powers, the value of UNCLOS dispute settlement when compliance seems unlikely. Unfortunately, uh, one of our commentators had to withdraw at the last minute due to unforeseen circumstances. So we won't be joined by Professor Penelope Neville, but we are lucky to have Dr. Won Hee Kim with us. Um, Won Hee is a, a veteran of these International Law of the Sea conferences, um, and he is currently senior researcher at the Korea Institute of Ocean Science and Technology, um, having previously worked at the Korean Maritime Institute and is a, also actively involved in the Korean Society of International Law, one of our sponsors for this event. Uh, and I'm sure he'll do a fantastic job of commenting on both of these papers um, by our two eminent speakers. Uh, the plan for the session is each speaker has been asked to talk for about 25 to 30 minutes um, in the first instance. Uh, and then Dr. Kim will uh, give his comments and ask questions and there'll be a chance for the speakers to then respond. Uh, and I'm also told that uh, there will be an opportunity to get audience questions at some stage, um, time permitting. So um, do keep your ears open and if you have questions, hopefully we'll be able to get to them later in the session. Without further ado, it's time for me to switch off my microphone and invite uh, Mr. Lawrence to deliver his presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to be here with you this afternoon. Um, since Professor Harrison's already uh, introduced me, I will skip that part and jump right to the subject at hand. Um, this afternoon, I'll be talking about the success of part 15 of UNCLOS. And I'll be speaking in three main parts. First, just some introductory matters to um, make sure we're all operating from a similar platform. Uh, I'm gonna discuss also briefly the issue of non-appearance, which doesn't really go to the issue of compliance as such. But it does strike me as a related phenomenon uh, insofar as it represents something of a challenge to the dispute settlement system under Part 15. And then I'm going to be talking about four particular cases of non-compliance with uh, judgments or awards under the law of the sea. Um, just a general observation to begin with, I think it's important to really 
appreciate the extraordinary achievement that part 15 of Onkelos is. To have a binding uh, dispute resolution system established in what is virtually a worldwide treaty with very limited exceptions um, is really quite a remarkable achievement. And uh, I, I think it'd be hard to overstate what uh, a core component and achievement of the entire convention part 15 represents. Now, I think everybody in this room uh, knows the subject more than well enough to know that um, under uh, part 15, states have an opportunity to choose a peaceful me means of dispute settlement of their own choice, effectively gives them the choice between international law of the sea, international court of justice, arbitration pursuant to Annex 7, and of course, arbitration pursuant to Annex 8 on certain limited subject matters. Uh, and again, I'm sure everybody in this room well knows that UNCLOS makes Annex 7 arbitration the default mechanism. As I said, there are only very, very limited um, exceptions to the compulsory nature of dispute settlement on, under UNCLOS. Um, now, the, I, I'm pausing on this one um, just because it does set up an interesting additional means of dispute settlement, if not binding dispute settlement. But under Article 298.1a.1, um, states can elect not to accept compulsory dispute settlement for disputes relating to effectively maritime boundary delimitation. I don't need to read the quote on the screen. Everybody here knows it well, I'm sure. But another really interesting innovation of uh, UNCLOS is in part 15 is that when states take advantage of this optional exception to jurisdiction, they have to agree that they will submit any disputes they may have related to sea boundary delimitation or other excluded matters to compulsory conciliation, which is a binding um, means of dispute settlement, or a compulsory means of dispute settlement, even if it doesn't result in a binding decision. Now, uh, to date, as I count, there have been in the neighborhood of 50 cases uh, brought under UNCLOS, uh, 29 of which have been brought to ITLOS itself. Now that includes prompt release and provisional measures cases that have subsequently gone on to Annex 7 uh, tribunals. And I was rather surprised by this number when I did the count. Only three, technically speaking, cases have been brought under UNCLOS per se to the International Court of Justice. Um, in those, if I remember correctly, are the Black Sea case, uh, the Costa Rica, Nicaragua cases related to the delimitation in the Atlantic and the Pacific, and the Somalia, Kenya case. There have been 15 Annex 7 arbitrations, almost all of which, 14, have been handled or administered by the PCA. One, the Southern Bluefin Tuna case, curiously, by the ICSIT Secretariat for some reason. Um, and no Annex 8 arbitrations, but one very, very important uh, conciliation pursuant to Article 298. And I see Sir Michael is in the room with us, and uh, perhaps he'll have some observations to share on the success uh, the very meaningful success of that conciliation between Australia and Timor-Leste. So, as I said, the first issue that I wanted to touch on was just the issue of non-appearance. As I said, I don't consider that an issue of compliance as such, but it is um, another way uh, by which states sometimes will uh, effectively thumb their nose at the system by simply refusing to appear in the proceedings. So in my mind, it's a, it's a cousin, if you will, to uh, non-compliance with a judgment as such. And there have been two cases uh, of non-appearance in relatively recent memory, last, well, within the last 10 years, I would say. The first is the Arctic Sunrise case between the Netherlands and Russia, and the second 
is the Philippines-China-South China Sea arbitration. Um, again, you can see uh, Article 9 of Annex 7 on the screen. Uh, I won't bother to read it, um, but again, the essential point is that non-appearance does not operate as a bar to proceedings. Not only does it not operate as a bar, uh, proceedings are specifically authorized to continue, notwithstanding the non-appearance of states. It does, however, place a special and difficult burden on the court or tribunal, as the case may be, because the tribunal court is obligated to assure itself in that situation that the claims, both uh, in terms of law and fact and jurisdiction, are well-founded as a matter of law. So, you know, the court or tribunal, uh, as the case may be, has to step outside its usual role, where it is deciding between two competing sets of arguments and take on to itself the responsibility for testing the applicant state's submissions. And this was a very, very significant burden, I would say, um, in the South China Sea case, where uh, the tribunal really went to great, perhaps even extraordinary lengths to uh, put the Philippine team to the test and justify its case in terms of jurisdiction, in terms of law, and in terms of fact. And that made the, the, the job of the tribunal just that much more difficult. Um, so it really does complicate the smooth functioning of the mechanisms envisioned in Part 15. Just a way of amplifying, amplifying the point I just made. Um, in the Arctic Sunrise case on the provisional measures decision, uh, Inlos was what I would say very, very firm um, in taking the view that uh, a state's non-appearance uh, is a problem of its own creation and a problem with which it has to live. It has to accept the consequences of its decision by not appearing, which is to say the case will go on without it, without the benefit of its argumentation, without the articulation of its position, at least in full. Um, and I think, you know, I would call this, in a sense, a success, because <clears throat> uh, although I view non-appearance as something of a challenge to the system, I think in the South China Sea case, um, in the Arctic Sunrise case, the entire system made very, very clear that it was gonna go forward regardless and issued very strong, very clear, very powerful um, awards uh, in those cases. The last subject I thought I'd address briefly this afternoon concerns the issue of non-compliance with judgments or awards. Um, to paraphrase the famous aphorism of Louis Henkin, uh, I think the reality is that almost all states comply with almost all judgments almost all of the time. So I could identify four cases of non-compliance. You can see them on the screen, the Nicaragua, Colombia, Arctic Sunrise, South China Sea, and then very, very recently, the delimitation between Somalia and Kenya, which was affected by the ICJ. So if we say there's a universe of about 50 cases or so, um, the number of uh, instances of non-compliance is relatively small, for less than um, 10 percent. Uh, notwithstanding that fact, uh, I confess I'm particularly troubled by um, the non-compliance, first in the Nicaragua-Colombia case, and then also in the Somalia-Kenya case, for reasons, reasons I'll get to. I'm just going to run through the facts of each case relatively quickly. Um, and hopefully set the table for further conversation uh, a little bit later in the panel. But first, uh, just a super technical point. The nicaragua Colombia case, it was not technically a case brought under UNCLOS per se, brought under Part 15, for the simple reason that um, Colombia is not a party to the convention. Um, but I'm including it here because uh, it was, for all intents and purposes, well, it was a law of the sea case, and it was decided no differently 
than it would have been if it were actually brought under UNCLOS. So it is a challenge, if not to UNCLOS, to the international law of the sea, and I thought it worth discussing in that context. Now, many of you will probably know that this case concerned both territorial sovereignty over certain islands off the east coast uh, of Nicaragua that, um, well, the sovereignty of which was actually in dispute in the case. Um, in its judgment, the, the court both decided the sovereignty issue and the delimitation issue. It decided that the sovereignty over the islands belonged to Colombia and thus proceeded to affect the necessary delimitation between the Nicaragua mainland coast and the Colombian islands. Now, Colombia's position um, was very firm and very strong. Its position was that the boundary should be along the 82nd meridian, which you can see in red there. Um, a very, very aggressive um, claim in the first instance that uh, is actually very close to the Nicaraguan coast. And I don't need to go into the reasons for that, but it was largely historical treaties um, relevant to the area. The court rejected that claim and then proceeded to follow uh, the three-step methodology. First, by drawing a provisional equidistance line, as you see on the screen, and then substantially adjusting that equidistance line to arrive at the final delimitation line you see on the screen now. Well, lines is probably a better word. It's a um, quite extraordinary methodological judgment in that the court used a variety of methodologies to arrive at this. But the essential point is that the court took the view that the mainland coast of Nicaragua um, was so much bigger, if you will, than the coasts of the Colombian islands that an equidistant solution would not be fair, not be equitable, and therefore a substantial adjustment of the equidistance line was in order with the results you see on the screen. And, and just comparing the two, you can see on the one hand, the straight line, Colombia's initial claim line with the final result. And you can see a very, very substantial um, difference in the allocation of maritime areas. Um, Colombia reacted furiously um, to this judgment. And for reasons, frankly, I've never entirely understood because they won the contested issue of sovereignty. Um, but rather than declaring victory and going home, Colombia uh, denounced the court, denounced the Pact of Bogota, which was the title of jurisdiction, and threatened um, uh, never to appear before the court again, in essence. Um, and uh, ha proceeded to continue to conduct naval patrols and other activities in waters uh, that had been declared to be Nicaragua. To the extent that Nicaragua, before the title of jurisdiction lapped, lapsed one year later, brought a subsequent case, which was just decided, trying to hold uh, Colombia liable for infringing Nicaragua's sovereign rights and uh, uh, sovereign rights and jurisdiction. Uh, I, again, I, I've never really fully understood what motivated Colombia's actions. But this case in particular, maybe to put an argumentative point on it, um, gives me um, concern about the system, the, the dispute resolution system, because I think for the first time that I'm aware of uh, in a Law of the Sea related dispute, you have a comparatively small state, um, Colombia, uh, rejecting a decision of the ICJ. And in my mind, that's substantially different, if you will, than when a uh, great power, like my own country, the United States, um, rejects a decision or rejects the jurisdiction of the court. Uh, I guess, in my view, it's almost to be expected that when a case implicates core national interests, a great power um, may be more inclined to reject an authoritative international ruling. But the fact that 
comparatively small country like Colombia not only felt empowered to do this, but did it, and did it so openly, gives me great concern. What also gives me great concern is that Colombia has effectively faced no consequences for um, its actions. This, of course, of course, implicates the question of enforcement of judgments and awards, which is very, very complicated. But the fact that Colombia did this, did it so brazenly and faced, frankly, absolutely no repercussions, gives me great concerns, concerns that maybe this is a model that can be followed by other smaller states. Um, Another issue, uh, instance of uh, non-compliance was uh, the Arctic Sunrise case. I see that I don't have a lot of my allotted time left, so I'm not going to walk through each uh, of these um, issues. But what I find interesting, I, I would call the Arctic Sunrise case a, a case of soft non-compliance. Russia never uh, accepted the judgment, never accepted excuse me, the decision of ITLOS on provisional measures and accepted the awards of the Annex 7 Tribunal. But at the end of the day, most of the things that Russia was ordered to do, it did. It released the Arctic Sunrise, albeit a bit later than it should have. It released the crew, um, again, albeit later than it should have. And it did ultimately pay the Netherlands some measure of compensation. Now, the compensation was the result of a formal agreement between the Netherlands uh, and Russia, in which Russia specifically did not accept responsibility, but nevertheless did pay about half the amount, as I said, awarded against it. So I would call this, although um, disturbing systematically, a, a softer form of non-compliance in that ultimately virtually everything that was awarded was given except for some money. Another troubling, um, very troubling, I would say, example of non-compliance is uh, the South China Sea case. And just to remind everybody, the central issue in dispute in that case concerned China's claims to historic rights within the so-called Nine Dash Line. So the principal object of the Philippines' claim was to have that declared uh, unlawful. A secondary element of the Philippines' claims concerned islands in the South China Sea in two areas. In the northern sector, where you can see a circle around Scarborough Shoal, and southern sector, a circle around the Spratly Islands. And the Philippines sought to have those features all declared Article 121, three rocks, so as to limit their potential maritime entitlements to 12 miles as opposed to 200. The idea there was to open up as much of uh, the area to the west of the Philippines as undisputed Philippine EEZ as possible. Now, during the case itself. I would say there, uh, China not only did not appear, but it actually um, overtly, aggressively thumbed its nose at the system. It, many of you will know that one of the core obligations while a dispute is pending is not to do anything to exacerbate or extend a dispute. Nevertheless, in the middle of these proceedings concerning the entitlement of these maritime features, China rather suddenly and dramatically went on an island building uh, spree. I'm just going to cite one example, Mischief Reef. You can see the location on the screen, well within 200 miles of the Philippine coast. And you can see what the Chinese installation looked like as of the time the arbitration was brought. This is what Mischief Reef looked like in its natural state before the fact, if you will. Um, this is what Mr. Freef looked like after the fact. China effectively turned this into a permanent immovable aircraft carrier. You may see all the way on the left there an airstrip that's an almost four kilometer long 
airstrip. So you get a sense of the scale of what we're talking about. And this happened at a number of features throughout the area. Um, and China was clearly motivated to accomplish as much as it could before the arbitration was over to create a fait accompli. But it was just a really, really remarkable show of disrespect, for lack of a better word, for the arbitral tribunal and I would say, um, by implication, the entire dispute resolution system under UNCLOS. Just to show you the final results, at the end of the day, the Philippines succeeded um, in having both Scarborough Shoal and the features in the Spratleys declared 121.3 rocks, limiting their entitlement to 12 miles. Um, you can see graphically the result there uh, in the northern sector and there in the southern sector. Practically speaking, the result is to open all of that blue to the west of the Philippines uh, and, and make it as a matter of binding international law as between the Philippines and China, undisputed Philippine EEZ. Of course, China um, has since uh, not only challenged the authority of the tribunal to render a award, it's uh, essentially uh, uh, dismissed the award as um, something that it will not pay any attention to. And I, I guess I find this example also very concerning and in my view represents a very significant challenge to the system for a number of reasons, both because of China's behavior, really uh, outrageous, if I may say so, behavior during the course of the proceedings, constructing those islands, um, and uh, also just because of the central importance of the South China Sea to the world economy. So China's actions here not only threaten prejudice to the bilateral relationship with the Philippines, but potentially, depending on where they go, if they continue to flout the award and uh, are not held to any consequences for the rest of the international community, given the importance of the South China Sea. I see my allotted time is running to a close, so I'll speak even more quickly to the other two cases. But before I do, just to give you a sense of China's continuing disregard of the award, on the screen are seismic tracks from 2021 in the South China Sea that China has conducted. And you can see that it's continuing to conduct its uh, science research activities uh, up to um, the borders of its nine dash line claim. So it continues very flagrantly, very clearly to insist on the claim that was deemed international and um, to behave in a according fashion. Last case I'm gonna speak on is um, Somalia, Kenya. It's a very recent case. Um, the very short version is that Kenya historically claimed a parallel of latitude delimitation and insisted that that should be the result. Um, there's some procedural history on the screen here. It was really quite torturous. Um, but a week before the original oral proceedings, the court, uh, Kenya informed the court that it had fired its counsel and requested a postponement uh, of the hearings on that basis. The court accommodated it. Kenya came back later because of COVID twice, asked for further postponements. Um, and ultimately uh, the hearing was scheduled now without resistance from Kenya for March, 2021. And the decision um, issued a bit later in the year. Uh, you can see on the screen, uh, the final uh, delimitation line from the court, uh, it effectively rotated the equidistance line about 11 degrees to the north from where the provisional equidistance line was. So a not insubstantial adjustment. Nevertheless, given the groundwork it had laid, um, Kenya reacted very vociferously against the award, dismissed the court, dismissed the award um, as unacceptable, called the court a rogue court. Um, for doing this, um, notwithstanding the fact that, frankly, given the simplicity of the coast here, 
the result was actually quite good from Ken for Kenya to, to receive such a substantial adjustment to the equidistance line, frankly, in my view, was legally unwarranted, but probably politically savvy of the court to make it more difficult for Kenya to flout the award. Um, I would say I find this example also very troubling. I, because you have a relatively, quote unquote, small developing state that has shown itself willing to flout the authority of the International Court of Justice, I, I think it may speak to a deeper systemic problem. You know, of the four examples that we cited, two of them are from smaller um, developing countries. And the fact that such countries feel free to flout awards and decisions gives me a uh, great pause. Usually we like to think of international law as being somewhat helpful for smaller states in their relations with larger states. They should, I think, embrace international law. For them to nevertheless uh, dismiss the authority um, of the court in both cases, uh, in my mind, speaks to grave potential difficulties with the continuing vitality of Part 15. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Martin, for giving us an excellent start to this session.